land where there are few material possessions, knowledge itself is material wealth. Not just any knowledge, but knowledge that allows its owner to control elemental forces. We might call this knowledge magic. Here, in a small village on the island of Ambrun, in the Republic of Vanuatu, these young men are in the final stage of initiation into a secret society, and part of the secret is knowledge. The society is called Rom, and its origins lost, but most probably Rom was a spirit. As these initiates dress, they take on the aspect of that spirit. Rom has given these men prestige and power so they must always be on their guard against a jealous enemy. The critical moment is as the mask is lowered, for if the dresser, who must be a trusted friend, is not alone, an enemy can run in from behind, slap a magic powder on the initiate's head, cancelling his power. This is the first time the dressing has been shown to the world. And in the fear that we may have been influenced by enemy sorcerers, we could only film from the front. The masks are made by each member, as are the cloaks, which are banana leaves. The last part of the costume to be put on is the arm, known as the wern. The musicians have their own preparation. knowledge to make pigs fertile, to render one invisible, to make yams grow, the rain fall and the winds blow. All members of the community join in, although the women's step is slightly different. Dancing in Vanuatu is a major art form, and part of the reason these men have joined Rom is to have the exclusive right to dance these dances and wear this costume. These rights and the knowledge which for the first time they are showing they possess have been paid for with pigs. Pigs which are then clubbed to death to give special meaning to the occasion. Kirk Huffman, director of the Vanuatu Culture Center, explain the meaning of the pig killing. It's not thought of as cruelty at all. All of these, all of these pigs are, are known individually. They're loved, they're looked after. Particularly the ones with good tusks, they all have names. Uh, traditionally, out in this part of Vanuatu, in the world of the spirits, the world where you go to after you die, the spirits of your pigs that you killed during your life, they're waiting for you. And that's heaven, that's heaven. You dance all night and you sleep all day and your pigs are there. So that's heaven. Killing these pigs does guarantee that they will be with you in the in the afterlife. Sends them on before you. Knowledge is power. Pigs are money. Pigs are what you buy. You're, you're, you're rising. You're rising in grade with. That brings you into closer contact with people that have knowledge, have power. It's a complicated system. Pigs are money. Pigs are power. Pigs are prestige. It's knowledge. It's knowledge. Which is the important thing. It gives you a better life than the world of the spirits. Two miles away, in the village of Olal, a ceremony marking the consecration of a new Catholic church is just ending. Here, the Catholic missionaries have tried to blend Christianity with the traditional life called custom. The rhythms are the same, only hymns are sung instead of chants. The slit drums are the same, only Christian symbols are used instead of custom ones. Monsignor Francis Lambert 
Bishop of Vanuatu, described the missionary's future. As long as the government is a Christian government and will understand the role of missionaries and uh, use the missionaries in the proper manner, I think Christianity has an important role and will do very much to help these people to develop and become a happy people and a healthy people and educated people and perhaps even we might say that it might become a country which is econ economically more or less independent. Vanuatu is experiencing a cultural revival. The past and the need to retain the knowledge of the old traditions are vitally important for the future. As we left North Ambrun, Corv and I were acutely aware of some of the problems facing the people of this beautiful country. How important would the knowledge of the Rome be ten years from now for these children? And would they be able to reconcile technology and Christianity with custom? On board our schooner La Violande, the crew were working on deck and underwater scraping the barnacles off the hull to give us the best speed. We had a great deal of ocean to cover in the next few months and every knot would help. While the crew worked on the schooner's hull, Anne and I used the opportunity to dive on the reef slope below. Diving is very much a homecoming. Even though the ocean bottom changes from one sea to another, it is never as dramatic as the changes we experience on the surface. Down here, weightless, I feel transported. The corals growing on this bottom are mostly soft corgonians like sea fans and whips, all corals that can grow quickly and cope with environmental changes. Movement in the Earth's crust formed these islands, and this movement continues today, making it difficult for the formation of hard corals, which need a stable platform to grow on. It was exactly like the bottom of Tana Island that we'd seen on our first dive. Feather stars, common to all oceans, are one of the oldest living animals on our planet. This is another species of starfish, and was probably feeding on the polyps of this coral. I couldn't see any large fish on this reef. Perhaps they'd been fished out. But there were small fish all over, like this Moorish idol whose feeding I'd disturbed. Most of the reef in Vanuatu grows on the sides of the steep islands. As a result, they drop away quickly to great depths. All around me, the corals are old friends. A branch of black coral in front of me, and this beautiful blue Alcyonarian. This is another Alcyonarian, and these tiny white dots are its polyps. It was time to leave the depths and the island of Ambrum. Cov and I wouldn't be diving at the next stop, but we look forward to the one after when we would be searching for a lost island. Getting a big schooner underway is no simple task, especially a traditional one like La Violan. Winches are minimal, and sheer effort is the order of the day. 
Both the foresail and the mainsail take the whole crew of Danny, Susie, and Catherine to raise. Once the large sails are up, it's the turn of the smaller ones, like the main topsail. And finally, with everything up, I set the fishing lines in hopes of a fresh dinner. But as I'm the world's worst fisherman, we never caught much. Don, captain and owner, knows his vessel intimately, and soon every sail is drawing perfectly. Our destination is the village of Barunku on the island of Maivo. There we will ask permission to visit the sacred site of Gombio, birthplace of Tagaro, one of the most important creator deities in the Pacific. We will also look into kava, the drink which led the poet Roger Duran to write, thus by the roots of kava each evening abandoned this world, the men of ashes and shadows, to return to the depths of ancient times. As with all our contacts, Kirk Huffman is my guide. Now, the chief has received our radio message that we put out on the on the broadcasting about us coming here, uh, but maybe he doesn't really understand that what we really would like to see is the site for which he is responsible, the site of Tagaro. Um, uh, Jeffrey, uh, when you ask him to say, can you hear me? You probably got some more message finished, say, if you say, you probably come, long place here. Place long Tagaro, long Bombio, long another site. Suppose he's already left him, you feel like a long place where he got right to him. Long look here. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm the owners of Gombio say uh, yes. Uh, you're welcome. I think plan to see the finish plan with the Samba Line. No, the come out. The long place here, long my way. You know, you know, looking one nothing. Time for one long every cinema. You know, you know, looking say any film long my way. They also say they are very glad to see you and the film crew arrive here because there are plenty other places where. Uh, film crews have gone and other islands have had uh, film crews working there. Uh, the outside world has never seen anything about my world. And so therefore they uh, say welcome. And uh, yes, the owners of Gombio say uh, we can go to Gombio. <laughs> Lango, lango, zavan, marino, zavan, bea. Chief George and Boy Mahambani arranged for helpers and guides to take us across the island to Gombio. We were told the walk would take about two hours. In reality, it took three times that to hack our way through the rainforest and cross the 800 meter high backbone of Maivo. Despite his age, Chief George led the way tirelessly. The first sign that we were on the right track to Gombio was this Namweli tree. In Vanuatu, the Namweli is associated with ancient and sacred sites and is their national tree. These leaves identify it as a species which is a cross between ferns and palms that goes back 150 million years. This tree is reputed to be over 1,200 years old. Throughout the trek, the men kept up a steady banter of what must have been endless jokes, for they laughed all the time. Kirk Huffman assured me that though they were light-hearted, they were constantly watchful. The supernatural is an integral part of their lives, and they are in contact with a wide variety of spirits, ghosts, dwarfs, and devils. This bush spirit is friendly. Others are dangerous. But disaster would follow anyone who broke the taboos or didn't accurately conform to custom.
Kirk also told me about Tagaro. Tagaro comes in many forms, different aspects of a creator deity whose origins are unknown, but perhaps came out of Southeast Asia thousands of years ago. He's known as Kwat, Ambat, Tagar, Tangaroa, and in this particular area of Vanuatu, Tagaro. He's a spirit of light, the creator of the world, and on my boat, benevolent. Kirk, you were telling me that this is the remains of the tree from which Tagaro made his canoe, is that correct? Yes, this area here is called uh, Haratano, and uh, Buratano, and uh, Tagaro lived out at Gombio. His mother told him to come up here and cut his canoe from this tree. And afterwards, this tree grew over it. There used to be three big, more things grew up, but they've been pulled down by the wind. This is all that remains of the stamp at the base of the tree that uh, Tagaro cut his canoe from. And they say in the old days, he used to be able to see the marks of his uh, stone or shell adds as he was cutting. Well, if we use our imagination, we can probably see it even today. Yes, yes, we're great. <laughs> Most of this area had once been cleared, but this was secondary growth and very difficult to penetrate. I'd noticed that ever since we'd left the canoe tree, the men had become quieter. Kirk explained that they had seen many more spirits, some of whom had thrown stones. It was not a good sign. Some spirits thought we were intruding. You know, Kirk, we've been walking now for about five and a half hours, but I was thinking all that time of putting this whole voyage into perspective. And it's a bit like uh, a Christian going to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in, in Jerusalem or a, a Muslim going to Mecca, is it? Aren't we going sort of into the center of their world here? Yeah. And not only <clears throat> are we here at uh, Gombio, which is Tagato's sacred site, we're right here in his Nakama, in, in his sacred hut, the remains of his sacred hut. This monolith is Tagaro's mother transformed and is the most revered artifact of the sacred site. We also witness this moving baptism, which assures the continuity of guardianship. The boy will have to learn 72 chants of Tagaro, a thousand songs, and 200 stories, which will take most of his life. Maivo has on most Pacific Islands, a major part of the diet is a tuberous, starchy, edible root called taro. Taro came to these islands out of Southeast Asia with the first settlers some 5,000 years ago. There's recent evidence that might put that date back beyond 20,000 years, making the forefathers of the Melanesians the world's first gardeners. Here on Maivo, these palm field gardens have a special significance. There are only two islands in Vanuatu that still pursue the old uh, system of uh, water irrigation for water taro. And this is the major one. According to the people here, it was Tagaro that gave them the knowledge that taught them to uh, irrigate the water taro. And this area here is renowned all over the country for the quantity and the quality of this water taro. This goes back about 15 generations, I'm told in recorded memory, but it could be a lot older. It could be, it could be. According to the chief here, yes, he reckons 12 to 15 generations. This river, whose source is in the high cloud forest, assures a continuous harvest throughout the year. Culturally, this is very important, as prestige is gained when a chief can provide large quantities of food for a feast and so demonstrate that he possesses the knowledge to control the spirits responsible for agricultural production. These men are clearing away a vine to dig up what is the most important plant in Vanuatu, kava. Like the taro, it was a gift of Tagaro, and its myth of origin and drinking ceremony drives deep into the cultural, physical, and spiritual world of the people. Kava is a shrub, 
directly related to the commercial black pepper plant. It produces a resin capable of inducing a state of tranquility and contentment without loss of reason, or so they claim. Immediately after digging up the kava, stems are cut and replanted. As with the digging, no metal tools are used, only wood. It will take three years for these new shoots to grow. Once out of the ground, the kava is taken to the village. All over Vanuatu in the evenings, men will gather on the dance grounds to drink and relate the happenings of the day, make plans for the future, and tell custom stories. Kava is also a ceremony of friendship, and this evening we were invited to drink with them. The preparation of kava is a ritual laid down by the spirits in what is known as the time before, this begins with the cutting up and separation of the roots. Only the small root ends are used, for it's in them that the primary narcotic is concentrated. Once the roots are cut, they're scrubbed and somewhat softened. After the scrubbing, the roots are ground into a pulp. All this time, I was getting more and more anxious. What had I irrevocably committed myself to? They're making this cover especially for me. Yes. Right. So we can see again that he's using, you call that a traditional stone. That's right. Is that a piece of old coral? Or? Yeah, it's sort of a limestone. A, a limestone. Yeah. Now, he'll grind it, and then he will put it through the, the strainer that yeah, he's strainer, sold. Yes. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very strong carver. So I'll be able to get back to my boat. Yes. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll depend on you. Yes. If I don't, you'll have to lead me back, right? <laughs> Aloha. Thank you. 
My gosh, that's strong. My whole mouth is numb. Mm. Number one. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Okay. You're waiting for me to fall. The carver had a very earthy taste, which wasn't unpleasant. But I soon figured out why it said that carver should be drunk sitting down. It's because after a couple, it's almost impossible to stand up. we crossed over to the west side of Vanuatu and to the tiny island of Val off Malakula. In 1919, the first film ever made in these islands was taken by an American couple, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Johnson. A crew of six savages from our small island of Val. What a fine crew to go out with. Yes, I'll admit that they were not a very fine-looking crew, but they landed on the small island of Bow in the New Herbides, a little island only two and a half miles across. Here are our three guides that we picked up for this trip. We afterwards found that they were very treacherous. As we would go along this island, we would see natives watching us, and sometimes we would land and talk with them. All of them had old Snyder rifles. Some of them were marked Tower of London, 1854. They were traded to them by the unscrupulous traders. Of course, it's against the law, but they were traded to them, and every time one of those guns was shot, it meant the death of a white man. Weren't you frightened, Mrs. Johnson? Yes, I was, but I didn't dare let them know it. Historically, there's little wonder that they shot at white men. For along with the rifles which turned minor feuds into major massacres, the forced labor recruiters, traders and missionaries brought pneumonia, dysentery, influenza, measles, diphtheria, whooping cough, and alcohol. Between 1850 and 1905, some islands lost 95% of their population. Today, anchored off bow, we're about to embark on what could only have been a Jules Verne fantasy to the Johnsons 65 years ago. The search for the lost island of Tolan. Vieni, uh, a direct descendant of the survivors, told us one of the legends. The, uh, the father had warned the two children, you know, that particular stone, don't move it. Uh, because, and then they, then the parents went over to the mainland to see the gardens. Uh, the kids, as usual, sort of played around and. Uh, Lifted up the stone and, oh, all this so the island, they pulled out. the plug and the island sank. Pulled the plug and the island sank, and the parents, when they came back from the gardens, we were on the shore and saw that the whole island been, had disappeared. And they saw people floating and holding onto wood and stuff like that. We have a mixture of myth, legend, and fact here. Versi's patch is, in fact, the submerged island of Tolam. Now, Vieni's lineage comes from this submerged island, so we have the, the myth of the, of the two children. We have the fact that there is, in fact, a shoal there, um, tied into another fact that a group of people, some maybe 200 or so years ago, 
were displaced from an island that submerged. If I can take the tank, I will pass the camera down afterwards. Got it. You got it? Our destination is a shallow area three miles southeast of the anchorage called Bercy's Patch. it looked like piles of rubble. But as I got closer, it was somehow different. I can't explain the difference. I'm sure it was just the legend playing in my mind. Yet somehow, there was something about it. These surge channels can be part of a normal reef configuration. Yet they're not scoured by the current as one would expect. In fact, they run across the current. This amphitheater was one of three and all of them had large areas of broken up beach rock around the sides. I didn't know what I was looking for. After 200 years underwater, what could possibly remain from a civilization that builds with wood and palm fronds? Yet this reef or shoal was unlike any other I'd ever seen. I searched for some positive sign, a bit of broken pottery, carved stone, anything, but it was in vain. Swimming slowly over the bottom, I came across this piece of beach rock. Perhaps it was its smoothness, or the way it lay on the bottom. But something signaled to me that it was made by man. It suddenly dawned on me why these stones looked so different. It was as if at one time or another they'd all been standing and over the years had slowly fallen. It was their angle that was curious. Viennese people, 200 years ago, came to the shore and built this monolith, which was actually 30 feet high, three times as tall as this, and probably the largest monolith ever constructed in this area. And it was originally <clears throat> down on the salt water there, and it broke into three pieces there, and the three yeah. pieces were... were and, and this were, is one of the three that's pieces? That's one of them, and there's another one. So this was maybe the top, the very top of the of the original monolith. I think it probably was, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've seen some stones down there which are exactly like what we saw on the bottom. I'll show Vienni what they look like. I actually lifted off the bottom a piece like that and, and it was flat, about that same thickness. And uh, I don't know what to say, but... Uh, all these rocks around here are very much like everything we saw on the reefs on the sunken island. Look at this one. It's just like the one flung around. It came over. The side was, I think it was more tilted though, wasn't it? I think it was a bit lower, yeah. Yeah. What we saw on the bottom could very easily have been an area just, just like this, with the walls going up and the higher on that side. And it could very well have been a, a ground very similar to this. Because we want to only look under the water today.
Crossing over to the island of Val with Anne, Aaron, and Kirk, we set out for the human sacrifice and pig killing grounds which are renowned throughout Vanuatu. Much has been written about human sacrifice and cannibalism in these islands, a good deal of it exaggerated, whether by missionaries seeking more funding or journalists seeking sensationalism. Kirk gave us his thoughts after seven years working here. Yeah. Here, we, here we are now on the Nesara dancing ground of Poterul. And this is probably the earliest one on Val. Uh, maybe genealogically founded in the 16th century. If we go up here, we come to the, uh, the sacrificial place, where in the old days, uh, there were human sacrifices here. There was a hut, a cooking place down there. They were rare. They held a lot of power. That you could jump the grading system. Uh, so it might take you uh, a thousand pigs, or it might take you uh, half a lifetime to achieve what you could do with one human sacrifice yeah, yeah, in, this, yeah, in this area. Yeah. This is a continuation of the same platform here. And here you've got a section originally carved out of the roots of uh, the banyan tree here. It was possibly an oven area there. The human sacrifice was actually cooked in an oven carved from the, roots, from of the roots of a banyan tree. Now, you were saying, Kirk, that there was a line of stakes back here. Yeah. Pigs joined to them by, uh, by rope. Mm -hmm. But they were sort of uh, spiritually attached to the stones as well. Uh, and the blood of the pig would mix with the... Uh, it's, it's, it was a very complex system. It is a very complex system, where the stones also represent ancestral spirits, the spirits of the ancestors. The pig is also at a certain level of analysis can represent the spirits of the ancestors. And you said that at one point up to a thousand pigs would be stretched the length of this. One of the largest ceremonies. Yes, there's a ceremony for a thousand pigs. Kirk, it's just incredible to believe that these huge dolmens of beach rock that were dragged up from the beach and consecrated by the killing of, of hundreds, maybe thousands of pigs. It, uh, it's uh, it's mind-boggling, the numbers. But you know, the really interesting thing is, <clears throat> if we leave aside the spiritual aspects of pig killing, just take the material side, the, um, you know, bringing together in public of the material wealth and then the destruction of them, that correlates with, in a way, what one can look upon as the biggest pig killing that this world had ever seen was the destruction of millions of dollars worth of uh, American military equipment on Million Dollar Point during the war. So the Americans actually perpetrated the biggest pig killing ever and not the Melanesians. And you, you could look at it that way. You could look at it that way. Here on Espiritu Santo Island from 1942 to 1943, the Americans built their largest forward base in the Western Pacific. When the war ended, millions of dollars worth of trucks, bulldozers and heavy construction machinery was thrown into the sea off this point. The purpose is somewhat obscure, but one widely accepted reason is that the manufacturers of the equipment, wanting to start up a peacetime economy, didn't want a lot of surplus flooding the markets, for it's been estimated that enough machinery was pushed off this point to build all the airstrips and roads in the southwest Pacific for 30 years after the war. Compacted and welded together by the sea, this vast dumping ground contains everything from aircraft engines to Coca-Cola bottles. Bob and I were extremely careful, as the entry here is dangerous. Jagged bits of metal are all over the place. The water visibility is almost nil due to silt from the rivers that flow into the sea nearby, and the surge threw us off balance. yard of gigantic proportion. Cranes, trailer trucks, bulldozers all piled one on top of another. It was like moving through a giant surrealistic sculpture. Mute testimony to our age of waste.
Right here in Santo is one of the largest forward American advance bases. At one time, there were probably over 300,000 people, American soldiers here, getting ready for the assault on the Solomon Islands, specifically Guadalcanal. The amazing thing is that there was not one single casualty directly attributable to Japanese action here in Santo during the entire Second World War. Not one casualty, that is, until we finally, in our research, discovered in this restaurant, hidden behind a wall, this gravestone, grave wood, I should say. Here lie Bossy, Tojo Hunter, 11 p.m., 9-9, 1943, because she was walking around during a blackout. Bossy was a cow and was the only casualty in the entire New Hebrides during the Second World War, attributable to Japanese action. Only this cinema remains active. In 1943, there were 54. The Americans built three bomber airfields, two fighter airfields, a naval yard, 50 kilometers of roads, six wharves, and eight hospitals, and hundreds of these Quonset houses, many still used. Other reminders of the war are the street names. Today, it's the Chinaman who's proliferated throughout the Pacific in the role of trader. days of the Pacific War, the Japanese swept through the South Seas, crushing all resistance and reaching the Solomon Islands by April 1942. It seemed that Vanuatu was next, and so the New Hebrides Defense Force was created. The veterans of this force were a proud group and parade regularly. We were told that they were happy that we'd come so that we could take back a message of grievance to the French and English government. It seems they were underpaid during the war and now seek compensation. Kirk assured me that it was a legitimate complaint. After the parade, Anne and I were asked to review the troops. Not having done anything like that since I left the army some 15 years ago, I felt very self-conscious. Felix. <laughs> Et qui a aussi ses médailles, mais que maintenant, avec le temps, il a perdu ses médailles. Ça, c'est pas vrai. Les rugons, plutôt. Rescue boats milling around on the South Sea waters and the goons where the troop transport President Coolidge struck mines and went down with the loss of only four officers and men out of 4,000. Efficient rescue parties hastily got the troops into lifeboats before the former liner slipped beneath the waves. And as a result, the foe was cheated of victory, the lives of 4,000 of our men. The bravery and coolness of the 4,000 threatened with death will live in history. The 32,000-ton liner is probably the largest marine wreck in the world accessible to sport divers. One man has been diving on her almost every day for the last 12 years. His name is Alan Powers, and even he admits there are places inside the hull he's never been. Coming through the entrance here, and just as the entrance, across the entrance, they had a net with a minefield, and the coolies went through the minefield. Obviously, the captain didn't know the minefield was there, and he was struck by at least two mines, and the captain just raced the coolies down here and beached her up right straight there. Liners have traditionally been used as troop transports as they required only minor modifications to handle soldiers. The visibility here was, if anything, worse than Million Dollar Point. I could barely make out Alan a few feet ahead. Our descending line was attached to the bow of the Coolidge, 78 feet down.
From there, we slipped over the side to the forward gun position. I wasn't nearly as at home on a wreck as I am on a reef. This was all new territory for me, and I stuck close to Alan and Crawl. From the gun position, Alan led us aft over the promenade deck. It's difficult to get used to her being on her side, and once inside, orientation is almost impossible. I swam in close to Alan as he showed me the hole made by the mine. It was enormous and seemed to penetrate halfway through the ship. The great irony is that the mines that sunk the Coolidge were American. It was hard to keep track of where we were going, but I knew that Alan had been diving on this wreck for 12 years, so I had complete faith in him. Now we were truly going inside, and I almost lost my mouthpiece laughing when I saw this row of toilets. Undoubtedly the first class men's room. From there we passed into a staircase, and I almost ran into that beautiful mosaic planter on the right. Then it was back to the promenade deck and down the full length of the ship to the swimming pool. No more bathing beauties. I was no doubt the first to swim in this pool for years. The really exciting find was yet to come as we penetrated into the ship to a fireplace which had above its mantle this magnificent ceramic statue. I think she must be Tudor because of the roses on either side of her head and the dress she's wearing. But whatever she is, it's a miracle she's lasted so long. Our air was almost gone, and we had a long decompression ahead of us. But I knew, even as we swam out of the wreck, that neither Anne nor I would ever forget the Coolidge and her lady. 